Um, and I, I want to say for those of you who are here, welcome. My name is Carolyn. I am um, with the WMU Alumni Association and we have um, been doing these throughout the month of July. Um, we are going to record it so that anyone who isn't on but signed up is able to watch it later and anyone else as well. Um, and what else? I, you know, there are so few people here that if you all have any questions or comments, you are more than welcome to put them in the chat if you don't feel like speaking. But if you do want to speak, that was part of the purpose of this too. So you're certainly welcome to do that. I will just to tell you kind of what these have been. We recently or earlier this year sent out a uh, survey to all alumni to ask them about their alumni experience, their student experience, and part of that included reflecting on their student experience and an open-ended question that asked about professors or staff who made a significant impact in their student experience. And so we had several names mentioned. You can guess one of them. So we have Mr. Jay Burko from the um, music theater department with us today. And I will not keep talking because I know he has a lot to share. So we'll, we'll get to him now. And I, I want to hear about what you were talking about, but I'm going to make you repeat some things. So before we talk about the show, I guess I, let me introduce you because for people who watch this and recording. So Jay is um, known as a playwright and director, and I know that you are a very sought after playwright and director, but I think our alumni probably think of you as a mentor and someone who encourages them and believes in them and gives them opportunities to, um, to get to where they are now. And I'm guessing, and you can probably speak more to this, but I'm guessing that some of them are struggling right now and wondering what the world is going to look like. So um, I'm sure they will enjoy this and I'm looking forward to hearing more too. Um, so now I'll stop talking. So can you tell us, and I obviously we were just talking, the pandemic has impacted everything we do. Um, tell us how it's impacted you and the music theater program. And I know you have some projects coming up related to that too. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to meet this, this small but mighty crowd here. <laughs> Hi, Jerry. I, I figured that was you. That you, you look like a little uh, camera on the screen here, but I know, I know <laughs> your name there. Um, gosh, the industry, the music theater industry, or the theater industry, the live, live entertainment is in, uh, a pause and restructuring and uh, it's a very, very frightening time uh, for everyone in our industry um, and particularly scary for young people just starting their professional careers, spending a good amount of money and time really investing in educating themselves to become the next professional theater artists out there and to see all of Broadway closed and I would say 98% of regional theater, including the professional regional theaters in our area, um, is not boding well for their optimism about the future right now. Um, the one thing that, and, and, and I, I personally have days where I feel very negative and, and feel like, oh God, what are we gonna, how, how, how can I justify this program? How can I just, you know, how can I encourage students to come here even right now during kind of a, a very, um, potentially different kind of year um, and, to, and to study this, this art form. And then I, I keep realizing that one of the things that uh, has kept the world moving forward is live theater. And the fact that here, live theater is an art form that has literally been around since before recorded history. And it's, it changes, it morphs, it's, it, uh, it's there to entertain, it's there to make a point, it's there to educate, it's there to, make, to be politically agitating. It's there, it's there because human beings need to connect with other human beings. And whether it's just to, to laugh or sing a song or to learn or to 
come together and, and realize that they are not alone. Um, theater has served that purpose so strongly throughout the centuries, literally. And I, I, I truly believe that we will be resilient, <laughs> and which is my theme song these days, I guess. And, and, and we as artists, it is not only our job, it's our responsibility to be leaders in whatever this world kind of evolves into. And, um, you know, it's interesting when, when, when they say, well, theater isn't essential or movies and television aren't essential. And I'm like, really? Because it seems to me that more people are watching television right now than doing anything else. And if you say actors are not essential, well, th let's just say everyone turn off your television for two days and see how well you survive this pandemic. Um, and I think they are hungry to be back in a space, any kind of space where they can uh, have that human connection of live entertainment. So that's what's kind of motivating me to move forward. And also the fact that my students, and I've been in touch with a lot of my students over the summer, even though I don't teach any classes in the summer, um, they are so passionate and excited about doing what they do. And I keep trying to encourage them to think entrepreneurially, to think about what, besides just the fact that you wanna become a stronger singer and a better actor and a more trained dancer, what can you do to deliver your art? What can you do to deliver your voice and your vision to an audience? Um, and one of the advantages Western has in terms of live theater as opposed to commercial theater. Commercial theater is set up very strongly in that it has to make money. It has, it has to be commercially viable. You can't just put a bunch of act, hire a bunch of actors and technicians and directors and choreographers and stage managers uh, and then not make enough money to pay them. Um, that's true somewhat in the theater department because we are, we are um, somewhat commercially driven. Our, our, our production program is entirely paid for by ticket sales, but we also have the advantage that we can continue to produce theater with our students for audiences, even if the audiences have to be outdoors, socially separated, wearing masks, in a parking lot, in their cars, what we can, we can find a way to do live theater um, that will be safe and engaging and new and exciting, hopefully. So that's what we're trying to do in the theater department right now. And we're, we're, we're putting together a, a number of projects for the fall that I think will kind of reinvent how audiences can connect with performers and how performers can produce theater. And I think that's very exciting too. And we're not just, as a faculty, we're not just kind of prescribing it. We're engaging with the students. What do you want to do? And I, a lot of my students constantly are saying, well, what if we want to do something like this? I'm like, look, great. Let's do it. Let's figure it out. You know, we're, we're not going to put, you know, 500 people in a theater next to each other and sing and dance in their faces. So let's figure out what we can do that's going to be engaging for our audiences. I don't know if that answers your first question there, but that's my introductory remarks. It does, but now I have to ask you, since you told me about a couple of those projects, I know you're, you're planning an outdoor show. Correct. We are hoping, all things considered, we are hoping to um, bring back uh, the department uh, when, when I was last on campus. Uh, the department, we were, I was directing a production of Sunday in the Park with George, uh, Stephen Sondheim's Pulitzer Prize winning musical. Um, and uh, we were slated to open it the first weekend in April. And uh, the, right before we went into technical rehearsals, the show was closed down and we were and then, 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 uh, then we were put into quarantine and off campus. So the show never happened. Um, and now we are strongly hoping that September 18th, we will be opening some version of Sunday in the Park with George. It will be produced outdoors. Uh, it will be produced uh, socially distanced. The audience wears masks. Potentially the actors may have to wear masks. Um, and uh, so that we're, but we're planning to do a live theater event of Sunny in the Park with George. Uh, it may be very concert like, but I think it may have full costumes and some very simple staging. And audiences can come. You can bring your you can bring your, your lawn chair and uh, enjoy 
some gorgeous music and a beautiful, beautiful story outdoors under the stars. Actually, it won't be under the stars. I think we're going to be doing it in natural lighting. So it'll be under the afternoon sun. And, um, and that's, that's what we're hoping. And um, right now it's moving forward. So I'm, I'm, I'm guardedly optimistic that it is going to happen according to our plan. We also are planning a number of other uh, theater events. One, one event we're planning is a theme-based kind of wa audience walkthrough theatrical event. Uh, which has no working title right now, but um, we're dealing with the, the theme of fear. And basically the idea is, is that audiences in small, small groups will walk through the Gilmore Theater building and in various areas will encounter performers doing thematic related material to this, to this idea. So they'll be very, very small groups. They'll have kind of like an audience of maybe eight to 10 people. Um, getting to see a section of a piece and then moving on. And so it'll be all over the building. And um, so that's something that you really can't do in commercial theater because you can't possibly make money that way. But I think it'll be very exciting for audiences. I've also been talking to a couple of my students. This is, a, this is just kind of a theoretical idea, but a couple of my students said, we, wanted, we, we, was, we used to do these cabarets. We want to do a cabaret. Why do, and I said, well, what if you did a, a personal cabaret in the parking lot? Literally just get a, get, a, get a music player, strap it to your body, learn your song, and people can pull up into the parking lot and you can perform it for whoever's in each individual car and just roam around the parking lot singing your songs to people in cars. And they can just sit there and have, you know, you could do like 10, you know, 10, 10 12 people doing the cabaret simultaneously and I'll sing to your car and you'll sing to her car and then we'll switch and you'll get the whole show eventually um, in whatever order it just happens to be at your car. So that's, that's another thing that we're playing with. And, uh, and right now we're kind of open to everything. Like right now, I think the most important thing is to say yes and. Um, you know, there's a lot of no out there and I dearly hope that people in our country start taking this completely seriously and um, we don't want to lose, we don't want to lose live entertainment. We don't want to lose sports. We don't want to lose just gathering socially. And that's what's, that's what's being put at risk by, you know, a, a number of people who just for some reason can't wear a mask or, you know, or, or want a certain kind of thing before it's time. And I think that Western's taking it very seriously. I dearly hope we get to be on campus and everyone's safe and that we have no you know, no virus research here at Western. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, there was a question about where you are considering as a venue for the outdoor show. Um, right now, our kind of number one option is the kind of, if you're looking at the Richmond Arts Center, mm -hmm. um, when you're looking right at the front door, there's kind of several steps up and then more or less a natural stage there. And so that's, that's what we're hoping to do the show. That, makes, that seems to make the most sense. Um, and audiences can just be right on that plaza area in their folding chairs or on a picnic blanket and enjoy the show. Perfect. So I, hope, I, hope, I, I don't wanna, <laughs> but all these things are still in the very much the negotiating stages. We don't know for sure about much these days. So that's <laughs> something to hope for, right? <laughs> yeah. Can you, so you were talking about this before I was recording, but I know there's another project that you're thinking, and I believe it's called WebEx. Is that what you were yeah, referring to? Web, it's called WebAx. WebAx. <laughs> yeah. Us, I mean, I feel you on that, but tell <laughs> us about that. <laughs> um, well, in, in my music theater workshop classes, I frequently do this exercise that I call recitative or scenarios. Um, and it's an improvisational exercise where I write short little scenarios that are kind of the, the story behind the scene. So it might be you're, you're on a blind date with someone that you really, really think is cute and all of a sudden you have terrible, terrible tummy cramps, you know, and you have to kind of play the scene. So I, I write these, some of them are very funny, some of them are uh, actually very, very serious, and some of them are pretty detailed. 
So I've been doing this kind of exercise work for a number of years. And last year I had a class that was very engaged with it. They loved doing this exercise. And I got very inspired and I decided to write a continuous uh, improvisational exercise. So I wrote a series of these uh, scenarios or vignettes um, that all tied together with, with characters that, that actually had several scenes before the, before the grand finale. And I wrote one that was kind of like a Tony and Tina's wedding kind of thing where it was a wedding and all these people, all these characters were kind of peripherally involved and it was continuous and every character had two scenes plus a finale. Um, and when we did the whole improv exercise, it was about mm, over an hour long. And um, so I had this class that was very primed to do this kind of work. And we went, we were, I was, we were teaching class, I was te uh, last spring, last March, all of a sudden, boom, we're doing you know, performance classes online. So I, I started writing uh, an extended improvisational exercise like this that took place on WebEx basically about a group of college students throwing a party on WebEx. And then all these crazy things start happening. Personalities get switched and there's a ghost and there's a murderer and there's a, someone's putting rats in people's houses. And so it was just, it was just kind of a spoof of those kind of teen screen, teen screen kind of stories that all takes place on a social media platform. And uh, so we did the improv. It was about an hour and a half improv. Uh, some of it was really, really funny and clever. Some of it was just a big mess. Um, but I, I recorded it like you're recording this. And I took that recording and I have used that as kind of the inspiration for WebEx. Uh, it is no longer a musical, but it is uh, coming together. I think it's going to be quite funny. And um, we will do a premiere of WebEx uh, we may do it on Zoom instead of WebEx, just because Zoom seems to be a little more stable. Um, but it, it's very similar. And uh, so that's happening. And um, as soon as I finish prepping my online class in the next week, I will dedicate the rest of my summer to getting the finishing touches on WebEx. <laughs> we want to see it. Are you going to let, are you gonna let us okay. show it to we're alumni? Gonna it for, we're going to do it for the <laughs> Make sure everyone knows because I, okay. I think it's gonna be great fun. To be honest, I think I think I've been in touch with a lot of other colleagues of mine at other universities, and, as well as professional theaters, and they're, everyone is dying to find material that can be done on these platforms. Yeah. And so much of that material that's getting done are readings of plays or, or and workshops, and they're basically material that's being adapted to this format. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. And the cool thing about WebEx is that it's written for this platform. It can't be done anywhere else. Right. It has to be done here. It's written to be done in this context. So um, you're not, you don't feel like you're com compromising. That, oh, I have to imagine this on stage. You can't imagine this on stage. It takes place on WebEx. That's where it takes place. <laughs> I'm very excited about that. I've told many people already. We're looking forward to it. So. Me too. <laughs> I have to ask about another project, though, and then we'll ask about you, because I know that a lot of people have probably heard about your Resilient Project, but there are some, I'm sure, who have not, and if they haven't, they need to go watch it, because it really does bring up a hopeful kind of emotional feeling. Just, I mean, I was singing the song while I was working yesterday. I turned it on in the background, so. Um, 40 cents in royalties then, great. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more, I watched a few and sent it on to a few, so. Can we, is it okay if we show it? Sure. We try to show uh, it? There are no royalties for this. <laughs> uh, yes, I hope you do show it. Okay. Uh, um, do you want me to talk about it before you show it or do you want to just show it? What do you think? I can tell um, you a little bit of background on it. Okay. Um, Dave Ogren and I are, are, are collaborators, collaborators. We've written a musical uh, called Matahari, which is a rock opera based on the life of the infamous uh, World War I spy. And we were slated to do a workshop production uh, in New York off Broadway uh, in May, which was canceled. And um, <laughs> among the many things this summer that I was supposed to do that are canceled. And um, so there's a song that, closes the first act called Resilient, um, when Matahari's life seems to be kind of 
teetering on the on a knife edge. You know, she's being tra entrapped into spying. Her life's in danger. They're threatening the life of her daughter, and and she um, she finds this kind of power within herself that she's just she just never gives up, and she's going to fight her way through. And she sings this song, Resilient. Um, and I always felt that the song had a really really powerful implications, uh, not just about Mata Hari's life, but uh, about all of us. Um, and when, when the virus hit, Dave and I were talking and I said, you know, this song is such a beautiful message and it's such a powerful kind of song. And it's, and it's, not, it's not kind of a kumbaya, everything will get better someday kind of song. It's a fight song, it really is. It's a song about being proactive to be resilient as opposed to just hoping things will get better someday. And it made me think a lot about the frontline healthcare workers. And um, so we kind of put the song out there. We were like, look, we don't want to make any money. We just want this song to be inspirational. And the next thing we knew, it had kind of, the whole idea of it had taken off. We had about 60 major Broadway performers who all wanted to sing on this music video. We, we managed to get about 14 actual doctors and nurses who sing, who are singing on this video. And all of the, um, the video has been adopted by several major organizations and it's been used for fundraising. So it's um, currently the, the organizations are Equity, um, uh, Equity, uh, Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS, um, their, their COVID-19 response fund, the Emergency uh, Nurses Association, which is an international organization from all over the world and the um, emergency physicians uh it's been a while since i've been pro promoting the video but it's the emergency physicians organization that's also a national organization the nurses organization has been incredibly uh responsive to this and so these the video has has was produced we learned a lot about producing music videos online which is tricky um and reverse engineering and some of the singers you'll see, you, you'll notice uh, Greg Jabara, who's one of the stars of the TV show Blue Bloods, who sings on the piece. Um, uh, Daphne Rubin Vega, uh, you may know because she originated the role of Mimi and Rent on Broadway, is on there. There are three other Tony Award winners. Uh, the kid that plays Harry Potter on Broadway in the Harry Potter show on Broadway is in it. Um, Aladdin is in it. The genie is in it. So like all these big Broadway stars, which is really cool. And, uh, and we hope the song has been really kind of inspirational to people, particularly nurses and doctors. And I've had so many incredible uh, uh, notes and messages. I got a message from a nurse in Turkey, just saying that the video has gone viral in Turkey and, and it, all of the nurses there are very you know pleased to, have this song. He said we play it and we play it in the ER all the time. And um, and, it, and it actually reunited me with a dear friend of mine. Her name is Megan Kramer, and she sings on the video. She's a nurse in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and she was an actress. I did summer stock with her for years, and she left left theater and has been nursing ever since. And she now has like four children and is an ER nurse and, and just a really inspirational person. And I hadn't talked to her in a while. I called her and said, you wanna sing on this video? And she's like, I have four kids and I'm an ER nurse in a, in a pandemic, but yeah, sure. And, um, but it really meant a lot to her to be on the video and it's exciting. So that's the video, it's called Resilient. Um, you can watch it on, um, we actually have a, a website for it called Resilient, resilientproject.com. And you can go to the actual website, which is a great way to go because if you do wanna make a donation, to some of these not-for-profit uh, organizations. You can do it, you know, there are links to all of their websites right on there. And that's the best way to see it. Oh, and a little bit of news. After this meeting, I'm actually having a meeting with the producer of a television show called My Fitness RX, which uh, is a nationally syndicated television show that I guess goes to up to about 60 million homes. And uh, they plan to show the video and do some uh, story on it. So that's that's awesome. <laughs> well, let's. I'll try to show it, and then I might ask you some more. But you all, everyone who's here, please forgive me. This is the first try sharing a video. I tested it. We'll see if it works. So if the sound doesn't work, 
I apologize. <laughs> I, I think I've got it figured out though. So here we go. Hey Dave. Hey Jay. Canceled my trip to New York. We're postponing the reading. I know. But you know that song Resilient that we wrote from the show? I think that could be an incredible inspirational ballad for the COVID-19 situation. You are right. Let's call Stephen DeAngelis. He could find us an incredible cast of Broadway talent, and I think I could find us some singing healthcare workers. Okay, I'm gonna get in touch with Broadway Cares, and we'll look up the American College of Emergency Physicians and the Emergency Nurses Association. And we can make a video. Do you know how to do that? No! When the battle swords are drawn And it feels like the final dawn The key is to be resilient When all options seem perverse Every day goes from bad to worse Then we to be resilient Never swerve and never bend We'll survive this in the end And the world will shine again And be brilliant Still sharing? I am. There we go. There we are. We're back. Good deal. I just well, I love that. I hope people could kind of get a sense of it. It seemed very out of sync from, Was from it? my computer, but that's not good. Did it work, Hardy? We good? <laughs> it was a little bit out of sync, but I I heard the song didn't cut, but the the the, the video was the one that was a little bit out of sync, okay. but it, the, the the song was perfect. Now we all have to go to the site and see the right, see it again. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we'll send you the uh, the website to the folks here so they can go watch it. Yeah. And I I know that it only takes trying to sing Happy Birthday one time with a group of people on Zoom to realize how much behind the scenes work that really does yeah. take. So a lot of people have contacted us and they're like, oh, how? How did you do this? I was like, this took about about ninety hours of editing to create. <laughs> so, 
Do we have any alumni in there? Yes, we do. Um, uh, Cassandra Sandberg, uh, who some of you may remember from shows like On the Town, um, is in it. And uh, Patrick, um, oh my goodness. Come on, Jay. Come on, Brain. Well, Patrick, okay. his name Patrick. I can't remember. Uh, we'll get it later. He was the lead when we did Kiss Me Kate. And uh, I'll think of his name in a second. He, Patrick has been in the, uh, has been a couple Broadway shows. Cassandra now lives in Los Angeles. So it's kind of great to have both of them. Yeah. And some people may recognize a number of the people that are sang on it were our Next Stop Broadway artists. So like Katie Huffman, who did Next Stop Broadway this past year, was in there. Karen Ziemba, who's a Tony Award winner, did it years ago. John Tracy Egan. So a number of our Next Stop Broadway artists sang on it as well. That's awesome. I love it. Well, I will, I feel like I should let you stop talking about work a little bit because we, we did want to, I mean, this will still be work stuff, right? But we, we did want to talk to you too and find out what's going on with you and hear about any memories you might have at Western um, for our alumni. So I'm going to segue into that if you don't mind going back in your memory a little bit, maybe you'll come up with Patrick's last name as we talk about memories. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us first how you ended up at Western? Sure. I've been at Western 17 years now um, in the same job. Um, and, uh, and at this point, you're probably going to have to take me out feet first. Um, but uh, I came to Western. I, I've been in New York. I moved to New York City um, kind of twice. I moved to New York in 1985, right after college. Um, and then I went, I left the city for about two years to get my master's and then came kind of racing right back. Um, so I pretty much lived in New York City nonstop from about 1989 till 2004. Um, and I did some teaching, I, I, uh, but primarily I was there as a freelance director and writer. Did, and um, one of the reasons I left New York to get my master's was because I had been a dancer and a performer in New York and I, I it wasn't really my goal my goal was to be a director writer and I was getting very distracted by kind of having a performance career and if I had stayed in New York to get my master's degree I felt that I would get I would start auditioning for things again and I, I got very lucky I was very lucky as a performer um, I did three national tours back to back right out of college I did Evita I did La Caja Fall, which has a lot of stories um, and I did Chorus Line um, and then a, supper, a number of smaller shows as well. I have a, I have a lot of stories. I have, a, I have a lot of stories about Lacage. Lacage was a quite an experience. Um, I'd never done drag. I'd never shaved myself. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one anecdote about Lacage. The first, the first time they did the makeup, we didn't do our own makeup. This was a Broadway show, so it was done on us. And I sat, I, and they did this like whole reveal thing, like in a salon. So I sat in a chair with my back to the mirror. I couldn't see what they were doing. And I was sitting next to another dancer named Carrie Sateslo, who was, had very fine features. He, he looked like Juliet Prowse. He was the most beautiful man you've ever seen. And, um, and I'm watching him transform, and he's like a butterfly. He's like the most gorgeous creature. And I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna look so beautiful. And they spun me around and I looked like Dustin Hoffman and Tootsie. And, and I was like, oh, what happened? He looks amazing. And they're like, you're, you're the character guy. You're the comic guy. You're not supposed to be pretty. I'm like, well, if that's your goal, you've achieved it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so, um, I, I, so I, 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 I came back to New York and focused really my career on directing primarily. I worked for a company called Theater for a New Audience, uh, and then I freelanced all over the country. Um, and when I was in Florida, in Florida I was directing a show called Jolson, which was a one-man show about Al Jolson. And we were trying to bring it into New York, and uh, the producer that we were working with said, you know, I really don't think I can raise enough money to do a one-man show. Why can you expand it? So we called the, the author, who was a screenwriter primarily, lived in LA, and he said he really just not, wasn't that interested in reworking the play and making it a multi-character multi piece. 
And at that time, I'd already done tons of research, and so had the star, his name's Steve Mohannon. So we decided to write our own Jolson show, which, uh, which we did. And literally, before we were finished, it was picked up by the York Theater, it was produced off Broadway, then it moved to a commercial run, and uh, was, it won an Outer Circle Critics Award, and kind of, kind of began my, my more <laughs> celebrated part of my New York career. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I had been in New York for about 20 years, and I was, I was down in Florida, I was directing, I was directing Jolson and Company at, 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 a, at a very well-known large regional theater called the Coconut Grove Playhouse, which is kind of a famous old theater in Miami, which is unfortunately no longer in existence. And um, this was kind of like the golden cage of regional theater jobs. I was being paid quite comfortably and treated very, very well. And I realized that it was still like an on the road job. It was in an, I was in a very nice hotel, but it was still a hotel. I was, you know, I was, kind, you know, it was, I was like, look, I, I don't want this lifestyle much longer. I've been doing it for 20 years. Um, and so I started looking for teaching jobs. And um, at the time, Terry Williams was the chair of the theater department and he was very aggressive in his recruiting of me. <laughs> And it seemed like a really good match. Um, the, the department was strong. Uh, the integration of the department with music and dance was, was exciting to me. And, um, and the students were really passionate. I remember my, you know, I came here and the first, you know, the, my, my senior, junior, and sophomore classes were students that I, you know, was taking over their education in the middle of their careers, in the middle of their college careers. So that was challenging. And then my first class, which they always kind of like near and dear to my heart, you know, and I actually, they're, I'm still very close with a lot of them. Um, but the, the, my first freshman class that started in 2004 were kind of like the first students that I actually brought to Western. But I, you know, the, 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 there's so many of, I take, I take 15 students a year into the program. Um, we graduated pretty close to that amount. So, and it's for 17 years. So now we're talking like hundreds of students out there and they're all over the world. Um, you know, they're, a lot of them are, are New York performers. Some of them are in LA, some of them are Chicago, some of them are Grand Rapids. Some of them are in, uh, one of them is a, is a, is, is a state politician. Um, they're, you know, they're not all in theater and it's, it's kind of remarkable where they've all ended up. And just this year, right before the world went haywire, um, we do, every year we take the seniors to New York for a showcase where they audition for casting directors and agents and jumpstart their careers. And, um, and I, I think, I'm looking here, I think I have the mom of one of my alums here, Rose is here. Um, and, uh, and Colton's doing really well too, actually, by the way, he's been performing nonstop. I'm sure she knows that. But, um, but uh, the, after the showcase, on, the showcase is on a Monday evening. On Tuesday night, one of our alums um, put together a cabaret of alums at Joan Tom Mama, which is a nightclub in Manhattan, right in the theater district. And we were, we were it was like standing room only. The, the theater seats, I think maybe, maybe seats like maybe 70 people, and there were probably 90 of us there. And, uh, and all these alums sang, and some of them I hadn't heard singing in over 10 years. And it was, it was literally the most emotional moment of my career, I have to admit. I mean, I was crying the whole time. Just, this is why I've been doing what I do. Um, and just seeing them living it. And it was, it was really, really beautiful. And I, I, um, I hope to, I hope, I don't know if we'll, we're probably not gonna be able to do that this year, but I'm hoping that in 22, when we're back in New York for a showcase that we will, because it was, it was an incredible event and it also really showed, you know, the alums that, what, what, what an incredible family the music theater alums have, are and a resource for each other and, um, and what a connection they all have. And it was a great kind of welcoming of the students that were just graduating too. That's really cool. <laughs> I love that. Do you have any favorite memories while you were at Western? Your your first class are kind of your like little the, spot in your heart. Like my babies, but um, 
I, you know, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of memories, you know, from, from productions and shows. I, I and, and, you know, now you're asking me and all these like, kind of like flash memories are going off <laughs> in my head. You know, I remember one where um, I, I teach a music theater history lecture class and um, they have to do presentations of various musicals and I encourage them to be creative with their presentations. And one of my alums, Patrick Newton, not the, not the Patrick I was talking about, different one, my Blue Man Group alum. Uh, they did their presentation uh, with Patrick as me. He literally did an, a pretty, pretty damn good imitation of me for about 40 minutes, which was, um, <laughs> it was funny and in retrospect, it's very charming. While I was watching it, I was like, oh, really, I do that? And he's like, oh yeah, you do that. Um, <laughs> but, um, Oh, some of my favorite memories. Any really funny or completely bizarre things happen? Oh, yeah. I mean, no. that sounds pretty funny, and I wish we could have recorded that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a lot, you know, what, one of the things that I love about live theater is how, you know, it's, it is spontaneous. You know, even when you have a script and a plan and it's rehearsed, you know, it's never exactly the same. And we were doing p the pajama game in the Shaw Theater. And in the show, there were, it was a pretty big set. It was a great Rorick design set. And there was a scene where they were going from like the factory to uh, Babe's kitchen. And, and they had this big roof unit that hung over the stage and the, and the factory unit flew out and the roof unit flew in, or the roof of the building, the, the kitchen. And so they're sitting around the kitchen table, Babe and her father and uh, the union reps from the, the pajama factory and they're discussing trying to strike to get this raise which is what the musical's about and as they're doing the scene the roof units are flying and they get caught on each other and they're trying and these are big like one of them is like 20 feet long one of them is like 30 feet long and they're caught and they're hanging like right over the actors and then you can see the ropes kind of jiggling and pulling and they're trying to free these two large units from each other and finally they they kind of get free, but the rope breaks. So one unit goes and the other unit goes boom and crashes down onto the stage. No one was hurt. It didn't hit any actors, but it was very loud and very noticeable. This like 30 foot thing falls onto the stage floor. And so the actress just kind of paused for a second and then the, uh, the, the guy that was playing Prez, who's the president of the union, he turns to Babe and he said, we've got to get this raise, your house is falling down. And the audience just started applauding. It was very charming. And um, eventually the stage crew came on and picked up this thing and took it off stage. But, um, but you know, they, that's, that's kind of, the joy of live theater, it's, you, know, there, you never know exactly what's going to happen. And, um, and I've also like seen some students kind of come up. We, I do a, a thing where I, um, when I first came to Western, we really didn't use understudies or what we in the musical theater industry call swings when you understudy multiple roles. And um, so I, I, and I, I thought that was important because it's a major part of our industry, particularly in long running Broadway musicals. And so I instituted a swing policy where there were swings and understudies for every role. And we were doing ragtime. And um, the young lady who was playing Sarah just lost her voice. She couldn't go on. And um, her understudy had maybe, I'd say maybe 40 minutes notice. She'd never performed the role. It's a huge role with an incredible, with a huge amount of singing. And she, she'd never performed the role. She had like an understudy put in rehearsal, like one rehearsal. She had one rehearsal in this major, major role. The costumes didn't fit her. They were very different sizes. So the costume designer, Catherine, some faculty, Catherine Wagner, and she was like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? And she, um, they, she ran up to the storage and she found a costume that, the lead in Carousel had worn that she figured would somehow fit. And, um, and the actress, uh, she didn't have contacts with her, so she had to go on wearing her glasses. Um, and she was flawless. She was absolutely flawless. 
she gave a perfect performance as if she'd been running that show for weeks. Okay. And then the last anecdote I'll tell has nothing to do with any of the people. We were doing the Wiz. <laughs> Did I tell you this story, Carolyn? We were doing the Wiz. It was an incredible show. I'm very, very proud of it. And, and it, was, it was challenging for me as a white director working primarily with, uh, with a black cast and telling a story that's very much a story about a black community and a young woman coming of age. Um, so it was, it was a challenging piece on a lot of, a lot of, on a lot of levels, and it was, I was very proud of the show. And it was going really well, and opening night was upon us, and I was all dressed up, and it came to opening night. And I walk into the theater, and my assistant stage manager comes to me at the door, this is in the Williams Theater, and she's like, Jay, there's an emergency. You have to go backstage right now. It's like 15 minutes till the curtain, it's like quarter of eight, or quarter of 7.50, I forget what time the show started, but it was 15 minutes. I'm like, what's going on? They wouldn't tell me anything. She's like, you just have to come backstage. There's two crises. So the first crisis was uh, Greg Jones, the actor that was playing the Wiz, who was doing the character kind of like a RuPaul version of the Wiz. So he had these huge, like six foot platform heels and one of them had broken. And we had another pair that we had bought earlier, but they were a half size larger. And he was doing all this choreography. You can't do dancing in six foot platform heels if they don't fit. So I was like, okay, take this shoe up to the costume shop and I don't care, put his foot in it and tape him in it. Just tape the shoe up. He has to wear the, sh he has to wear the ones that fit, just tape it up and fix it. And they're like, it's not gonna be pretty. I'm like, I'd rather him have a not pretty shoe than break an ankle. So that was crisis number one. And to be honest, the audience really didn't notice. It was fine. Crisis number two, more noticeable. <laughs> they said, <laughs> we had this little dog um, who was playing Toto. She was very cute. She was good, she was sweet. She did everything you wanted her to do. But opening night, she started having her period. <laughs> so they're like, I'm, I'm like, look, this is, this is not something I've ever dealt with in my theater career. I've actually never had a female dog. <laughs> You've given students a great one. I <laughs> periods like people did. Um, <laughs> And the costume was like, you know, half the show is Dorothy carrying this little dog. She's like, she is not picking that dog up and getting it near her costume. Well, the dog goes to Oz, the God, she's there the whole time. Uh, I was like, all right, quick decision. Someone build this dog a diaper so she, could, so she can do like the, the scenes in Kansas. And, uh, and she's not going to Oz. She's just gonna stay in Kansas and welcome Dorothy back at the end. So that's what happened. Toto didn't get to go to Oz and she had to wear a diaper oh in the first scene. And the audience is like, why is that little dog wearing a diaper? We never explained it. These are life lessons. How to respond. <laughs> but you know, it's, there's, a, there's a question I, I've always felt like, I, I spent many years of my life running summer theaters and I always had this policy of like, no question is to, obvious you know like always ask that obvious question because the one time you you say oh this is so obvious of course it's going to happen is the time it doesn't happen and you're in a problem so i'm like look i'd rather i'd rather ask the stupid questions and have the stupid answer than not ask the question and please don't feel no there's no question that's too obvious or too stupid ask it so next time if i have a dog in a show i will ask is this dog neutered? <laughs> well, you all could be event planners. I, <laughs> <laughs> I would well, also is ask, is this dog female? You know, like, I, things that I didn't even think like mattered. <laughs> so true. So I true. did a, many years ago, I did a production of As You Like It that featured a lamb and the, the lamb had to wear a diaper as well. <laughs> The stage manager was not happy when she had a contest to name the lamb and the winner was dinner. <laughs> not just dogs. <laughs> oh my gosh. We had another question for you and I, I will then wrap I, I, things I, actually, up. I want to one other alum story because this happened just last Okay. One of my 
absolute greatest story senses of pride is seeing our alums work professionally and whether it's on broadway or whether it's in regional theater doesn't matter our television film i just the, seeing them pursue their craft is so beautiful to me and um so last summer i wrote i years ago i wrote a play called what a glorious feeling which is in one of my bio musicals about gene kelly and it's been produced literally internationally it's been produced in england and it's been produced in south africa oh no and um and all over the u.s and uh i was contacted by um the uh the chair of the theater department at northern michigan in marquette because they were starting a professional summer theater and they were going to do the show and they wanted to know if i would come up and direct and I, I've been in Michigan for 17 years and I've never been to the UP. And I was like, oh my God, a paid vacation in the UP. I'm going, I'm going to go do the show. Um, and they let me cast anyone I wanted. Um, so there are five people in the show and three of them I cast with alums who didn't know each other. They were from different times. Bo Hutching, Caitlin Weichel and, uh, and, um, and Molly and uh, they all came up there and got to know each other and, and particularly working with Bo, who I hadn't seen. I hadn't, I'd seen him in shows, but I hadn't worked with him. Like his last show was, was on the town with Cassandra. So he was, and he was playing the lead, he was playing Gene Kelly. And it was really kind of incredible to see him as a mature, powerful, professional performer, really being able to bring kind of who he was and his, all the kind of natural charm that he had that I knew would be right for the role, plus his maturity and strength and his incredible dancing. So it was, working with alums professionally was really an exceptional experience for me. And there's so many out there now, I would love to have the opportunity to work with all of them. All right, go on here. You never know, you never know. Well, I, I have to ask this one because Sue wondered what's the, your absolute favorite show that you've directed at Western? Can you even pick? <laughs> I can't pick. I can't pick. I have shows that are my favorite shows, regardless of where I've done them. Um, and so like my kind of my favorite shows that I get to do, Man of La Mancha is one of my favorite shows. Just kind of, I love the music. I love the story. I love how inspiring it is. And to be honest, I've done it a number of times. Um, and I tend to, when I have the opportunity to put it in a season, I, I generally put it in a season when I'm feeling kind of like, oh, humanity is just full of a bunch of jerks. And we are, we are, we are not a good, we're not a good civilization. And, you know, Man of the Month is an incredibly inspiring story about this crazy knight who kind of believes that somehow goodness will win over man's natural inclination to not be pleasant and or to be downright evil and murderous and uh so i, I feel like we could use a little man of la mancha now we could use a little don quixote striding on a donkey telling us what the world should be um so for me that's a very inspirational production and we did a very really exciting production it was the, it was the first time i collaborated with our set designer dave Nofsinger, who designed this magnificent world for the show to exist in. And the cast was really, really strong and got it, like got what they were doing. Um, and kind of that's how I was feeling about Sunny in the Park, which is one of the reasons I'm excited that that's gonna come back. So many shows. I've done 34 shows at Western now. Plus I did about nine at the Civic too over the years so there's just a lot of shows that i can't make you pick i can't you can't make you pick <laughs> well i will not i will ask you one more thing because you as you said you've enjoyed seeing the alumni and their success and watching as they go off to do big things and getting to work oh, with yeah. them oh my god Conahan. Oh. patrick conahan oh i was gonna say there somebody put that in there there you go <laughs> <laughs> so i'm gonna ask you as my final question and then i'll stop recording but um for those alumni who maybe are worried or struggling or like what's what's next any final words of wisdom or of hope for them 
I, I guess yes. Um, and I've, I've been, I've talked to a lot of alumni recently, um, you know, including, um, Brian Martin, who was literally had worked his entire life was making his Broadway debut when this hit. So it was like his, his first Broadway show and he's 30 years old, you know, when he, his first Broadway show and, um, you know, the, the world is truly, you know, in Gilbert and Sullivan terms, the world is topsy turvy and we, we will be resilient. And I truly believe that. And I truly believe that the, what we have to offer the world needs. And right now, right now society doesn't necessarily recognize it. You know, they don't realize how important the arts are right now, both as a diversion and as an educator and as a way of bringing us back together. And we are going to, it's not going to be easy to bring this, to bring us back together after this virus. It's not going to be easy to bring this country back together. I'm not going to get political, but our country is not together. And, uh, and that, you know, but it has to be, you know, we can't go on like this. We can't be this divisive. And it's going, it's going to take that perspective of artists and entertainment and theater to, to do that. And I think that there's got, you have to kind of hunker down right now. The same way we're hunkering down in our homes, the same way people are dealing with being unemployed, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to make a lot of sacrifices and a lot of choices. Um, and, you know, just know that the audience isn't going anywhere. They will be there excited to have us back. Um, and ultimately, I think that um, there, there are going to be other ways of delivering what we can do. And I think that that's what, what we need to do, what, what we need to be spending our time doing right now. And don't beat yourself up. If you're like, look, I'm just, I'm depressed and I'm not creative and I can't, I just, you know, all these people kind of like, oh, I'm doing a web series or I'm doing, you know, and I just don't, I'm not motivated. You know what? That's fine too. <clears throat> That's absolutely fine. You know, it, to be creative, you need to be in that space. And if you're not in that space, don't beat yourself up. Just kind of let yourself binge watch Game of Thrones and enjoy it and don't worry so much. And uh, there's, what's the, there's, plenty, there's always somebody else who's going to be worried for you. <laughs> so I, I, I don't, that was a kind of a rambling word of wisdom, but I, 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 I think that, um, and reach out to each other, even if it's on, on Zoom, you know, just don't, don't try to, try to not allow yourself to become isolated um, and, and, and wear a mask, God damn it. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> well, I don't think it was rambling. And I think people will appreciate it. And I appreciate it. So I will, I think at this point, we have to let everyone go because people are heading back to work. I just read that someone, Taria Evans, Irwin, says thank you. She's heading back to work. So, um, so I will say thank you. And to those of you who could join us, thank you for that. And Jay, I feel like Hardy and I are probably going to end up asking you for some advice because you have all the, all the creative ideas. <laughs> so we'll come bother you eventually for some thoughts of our own. Um, well, but I appreciate it. Thanks. And I, you know, I wish you great luck with the rest of your alum series. Yeah, thank you. And I, I will. I intend to bother you again. So okay. thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thanks for all the stories. You made thank us laugh. You. <laughs> Bye, everybody. And so everybody else. If you need anything, please feel free to reach out to Hardy or me. Um, and if we can help, we will. So go Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.